Juliana Stan Campiano, all the way from Seattle. Welcome to the Sales Podcast. How the heck are you? I am great. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So you are an author. Got your book here. Woohoo! Radical Outcomes, How to Create Extraordinary right. Teams that Get Tangible Results. Your company is Oxygen, a fresh experience created to give you a new way to work. So look, that's all fine and dandy. What does that really mean? <laughs> what does this mean? Don't give me the yeah. PR spin. Come on, I'm a human being. I'm from the South. English was an elective. I need you to keep this like really simple, okay? No problem. Uh, and it's a great question. I think, you know, we see that things are moving so fast today and our working spaces and our corporate spaces are changing and evolving. And I think a lot of startups do this naturally. Um, you know, smaller, mid-sized companies don't do it as naturally and large enterprises definitely don't do it naturally. But it's, you know, it's um, moving quickly. It's iterating. It's having transparency and collaborating. It's not going in holes and coming out with something and expecting, you know, that it's a great thing six weeks after somebody asked you to do something. Um, so it's literally... What? You mean you can't fake it till you make it? <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, and it's interesting. So many years of selling, right? Supporting sellers, um, which is a big audience that I've always loved because I started out in sales. And um, I find that sellers do this very naturally in a lot of ways. And a lot of the rest of the organization does not, especially the part that supports sellers. So it's kind of this fascinating dichotomy in my mind of trying to take some of the things that I think sellers are amazing at um, and moving it into more parts of our organization so that they can work similar to how the sales force has to based on client needs. So walk me through that. I think I know what you're saying because I'm a salesperson. Yes. Um, yep. and, and, and I know people, I mean, historically, if, if we're going to stereotype people, yeah. which we should not do, but we all do, um, <laughs> you know, the accountants and the operations people, they're the bean counters and they're the spreadsheet people and they're wearing the, uh, you know, the bow ties and uh, they are very just on, on the ball and salespeople, we're just drinking whiskey, uh, playing golf, uh, hanging up, taking, people, taking people yeah. to lunch and the orders just come in because marketing just does such a great job and operations does such a great job. You know, they right. make a great product and marketing just market it. Very, it basically sells itself. So salespeople are really just paid to uh, become alcoholics, right? You're right. It sounds so, so much better than what the reality actually is. I think right. I'd like to go back to that reality. Yeah. Um, you know, no, and I think you, you know it and the listeners know it is that you, you know, you're doing deals and you're in different parts of organization where people are, um, have fiscal responsibilities and they have things that they are asked to do and drive for a company and you're there to help them do those things. And so, you know, in order to get from a meeting, right, to a sale, there are so many different things that have to be orchestrated and created and done. Um, and, you know, I think that that pressure of showing up to the client meeting and, and having an idea of like how you want it to run and what kind of supporting materials you actually need and who should be there with you and what their role and what's your role. You know, those are the details that sellers, I think in part naturally think through a lot. And, and then there's the timing of the text to the you know, client or the timing of the next call or the thing that you send them, or, you know, all those little bitty movements in order to get to some sort of deal in order to help a customer drive something forward is it's a master orchestration and there's a lot of work that goes into that. So there's stuff that has to be created, um, but it has to be created with the customer conversation in mind, right? So, okay, well, that's great that you created me that thing, but can you tell me how I'm supposed to talk about that to my customer? Because I don't think my customer's going to understand that, you know? And so we find a lot of sellers creating their own stuff because um, being in front of customers and having customer conversations, you have the context, you understand what's needed, and you end up having to take whatever it was that maybe marketing created for you and rejigger it to meet the need that you have. Um, and that's a, that's a high stakes situation that I don't know that people can have a lot of empathy for unless they're in it. Right. 
So I see on your LinkedIn profile, you're the founding member of the Sales Enablement Society. Yes. So is that, and I've been, like I've heard of sales enablement over the years mm -hmm. and really been digging into it the last year or so. Uh, I've worked primarily with small businesses in my role, but I'm going after bigger businesses. I've worked at bigger businesses. Okay. Is that what has kind of maybe helped spearhead the, the book? And, and have you kind of been doing that before it was even a, a phrase, kind of bringing everything together <laughs> yeah, the sales so, team? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And it's fairly funny. So we spoke a little bit before we got on about kind of our stories, right? Um, well, Oxygen was originally a UK-based company, and I got turned down three times to be a salesperson for them because I didn't fit the mold that they thought a seller looked like. And, um, you know, a lot of that was to be highly coin-driven in their mind. And I was like, no, I know that I'm going to hit sales, but I'm going to do it in a different way. And, like, it's my passion for what we do and what we can bring to people that's going to drive sales. And like that shift or mindset just wasn't what they were looking for or thought would make somebody successful. And then when I eventually did get, get on board, I said, don't tell me what, I don't want to know what my quota is because I don't want to just have to work to meet that number. I want to see how- You didn't want to know what your quota was? No, I, I wanted to see how far above I could make it. I said, just tell me when I've met it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and that's it. And then I'm going to keep going. Um, you know, and that's, that's a bit of a different mindset, right? And um, they didn't kind of know what to do with that, but I, I blew it out fairly quickly and Microsoft was a large client. I had contacts there having come, in, come from Microsoft and um, put a business plan together to open a US office and did that fairly quickly because we grew so fast. Mm -hmm. um, and then I ended up taking on uh, Oxygen the following year. So buying a company in 2008, so you can, you can, appreciate this for how long you've been running your own business. <laughs> you know, having, having a business in that time was an interesting time. And it happened that so I was you, in sales. You bought, you bought the company? I did in 2009. Nice. Yeah. yeah and uh, it happens that we, I've been doing sales enablement all along, but I didn't know that that's what it was called. And I would say a lot of people are in that similar boat. In fact, I would say if you're not doing sales, um, or, or actual engineering or some sort of development of a product, you're probably in a sales enablement function, right. whether it's marketing or learning or, um, you know, potentially even IT, right? They're all there to support selling whatever it is that, you're, that the company is creating um, for the market. Right. So, you know, sales enablement means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, the society was brought together to help to define uh, sales enablement and to elevate the role in the organizations. Um, I think, uh, personally, I think that today where it's at is that it's maybe, it, it's partially helpful and sometimes not helpful. Um, and I was on a call just this morning with somebody who's a seller of very large enterprise deals. And uh, I'd sent her a white paper about sales enablement. And she was like, oh my gosh, you just opened my eyes up to this whole other world that I didn't even know existed. And I wish I had. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and I see sales enablement, its primary role is supporting sales to have successful customer conversations that end up in revenue for the company. Right. So let's go back. Why did you buy the company versus just starting your own? Uh, that's a great question. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of story around that and I can tell you lots of, lots of details that I probably won't go into, but, um, Hey, I, I've told the kids they're bringing me food. They're, they slip it under the door. I, I got <laughs> coffee. I got whiskey. I, I can go a long time. Plenty of time. Um, you know, it came down to, I, uh, I had a, we had a client, right. And I wanted to be able to retain, um, the different clients that were in the organization that I'd been working with. And in order to do that, I had to buy, some of the rights there's also so i also learned a lot about uk law versus uh, us law right so it was a uk company not a us company things are done fairly differently um but it it, it worked out so the the other thing i would say is i had employees and i had people that i was paying that were doing a job for me and i wasn't just going to kind of up into everything and scatter everybody i it, i had a foundation and so you know, we always kind of joke that the, at the end of the day, the best thing that I bought was the name. 
<laughs> and then, and then from there, you know, you just, you kind of keep running with it. Uh, yeah. But it, you know, it's an experience. It's an experience to go through buying a company. I was fairly, so also I was younger. <laughs> I had, I had less responsibility, um, you know, and I could be all in on these things and half of the time. And I didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing. Very right. frankly. I knew that I had work that I loved doing. I had people that I was enjoying to work with and I wanted to continue doing that. Um, was the company even up for sale or did you just broach that subject? Yeah, no, the company went into what they call administration in the UK, which is bankruptcy. Oh, so okay. Oh, good. The, so yeah, that opened so the door so for I you. bought it out of that. Yeah. Oh, cool. The founders that had started, I mean, it's 2008 hit and lots of large deals were pulled very quickly and people are scattering. And I would say the UK was in way worse of a financial oh. state than the US was at that time, which seems kind of crazy. Right. Good but I went you. back and forth quite a bit. And, you know, my favorite call with the lawyers negotiating this was, well, how do we know that you didn't put the company into this situation so that you could buy it? And I was like, well, if you could see me right now, I'm eight months pregnant. <laughs> I didn't want to buy a company. <laughs> I wanted to have a kid and have some maternity leave, which is yeah. apparently not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, I, um, I was very instrumental at Lehman Brothers in creating uh, mortgage uh, le leverage buyouts and credit default swaps. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I did all of that. You're right. You know. <laughs> yeah, I made, you know, people pull millions of dollars. You know, trillions our, right? well, yeah. just out of our own budget right to yeah. like, make it all fall apart yeah exactly oh man so, that was interesting so how did you know it had hit rock bottom or, or was the company basically it was basically buy it now or, or just all goes away yeah uh it was in that that yeah. kind of a situation and so it made more sense to do that than to try to start something else over in so my mind you, did you have to get loans or I mean, how no, did I'm an extremely that? good negotiator. <laughs> oh, good. You figure out your leverage points, right? Just sure. as we do in sales and you take big bets and risks and see if they pay off and you kind of detach yourself, you know, at the end at the final bid that I put in, I was like, well, it's out of my hand, whatever happens next happens. And I got a call at the ninth hour that said, there's somebody that's uh, potentially going to put down, you know, quite a bit, like three times more money than you to buy the company. And I said, well, I wish you guys the best. Yeah. Take that money. Yeah. You should take it. Were, were, they, were they bluffing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's sometimes it's good to just, <laughs> I mean, once you go all in, you're all in, right? You can't go any more than all in. So no. sometimes you just got to call their bluff. I mean, that's the old adage, you know, if you're not ready and willing to walk away from the table, you have no business being at the table. Yeah. Right. I, I think it's one of the things that I, you know, I read Mahan Kalsa's book years and years and years ago. And it was one of the best things I thought in the book was offer to walk away. And uh, when you offer to walk, I'll, I'll leave uh, that. let's get real or let's not play. Oh, okay. And um, he says, and it was, I think it was later bought by, uh, it was bought by somebody. Anyhow, the, the one part that I really took away and used have used quite a bit in my own sales career is offering to walk away. Yeah. And that, that's a scary prospect when you're, you know, in, in a mid level range potentially of sales and you're trying to hit numbers and you're heck, I, you know, is running a company and you're trying to make sure you hit payroll. I'm a cash basis company. We don't talk about those very often because they're not very sexy, but um, there are lots and lots of cash based companies out there. And I think it's interesting to know that, but you know, you carry the weight of um, paying for healthcare, paying payroll, paying, you know, all the things that you have lined up for your business every month and walking away from a sale can feel very scary, but it's also the best thing that I have found because typically they come back and go, no, 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 no. We want yeah. that. Yeah. That thing you're talking about, we want. Don't yeah. tell us we don't want it. <laughs> Well, I mean, a good friend of mine, he'd always say, I'm looking for the guy looking for me. You yeah. Know, I, I yeah. want to sort, sift, and separate. And that's what I teach people in my training programs. You know, I want to sort, sift, and separate rather than sell. Yeah. I mean, the reality is I hate selling. I hate the gamesmanship. I hate overcoming objections, blah, blah, blah. It's like, I want to find people, you know, with this gaping neck wound, just oozing blood. And then like, Hey, 
I got stop I got, it. I got some screws. Uh, yeah. I, I got some band aids. Uh, yes, yes, I'll take all of it. Okay, I'm happy to help. Good thing I got here when I did. You know. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. that's the real deal, right? But yeah, some in the beginning, you got to pick up the phone. You got to hustle. Um, yeah. Well, you know, we're we're selling into a space of a lot of enterprise clients. So that was my background. You know, and we've played in that space of Fortune 100s for a very long time, and they have many options, and they have bigger budgets, and they can go for the big name versus a you know a smaller name. And somebody told me recently, they said, "Yeah, well, you never get fired for hiring McKinsey." Yeah. And I, you know, and I just I thought, wow, that's such a brilliant saying, and also just like made me so depressed all at the same time because I was like, "You're right, nobody does get fired for that, but you also might not make as much progress as you could." Yeah, you also yeah you don't make a name for yourself. I mean, I, I sold hardware for a while, and it was the same adage. Nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. Right. There you, you know? go. And I'd say, yeah, nobody else, nobody got promoted for buying them either. Mm-hmm. You know, now I was yeah. selling like some bleeding edge technology. So I needed, I had to find that go getter, right? Wanting to make a name for themselves, willing to take a risk. Uh, yep. Yeah. Nobody got fired for buying IBM. Well, you know, interestingly, that's a little bit the space that we find ourselves in today. So the book offers a way in which to work for people that are in marketing or learning or um, these operational kind of functional um, vehicles for sales. Mm -hmm. It's radically different than how people have been working for the past 15 years. Right. And um, they don't typically like me very much. I don't understand why, because I think I'm super nice. But uh you know, it's, it, it changed. Would your kids yeah. say you're super nice? Come on, tell the truth. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. <laughs> they would ultimately, if somebody that we didn't know asked them, they would absolutely say that. <laughs> uh, in fact, my son with the book coming out, he was like, I want to be the first person to read the book, mom. Nice. I was like, nice. So he was bored one day. I said, go read my book. <laughs> he was like, okay. <laughs> and what did he say? He's like, it's very good. You're very, it's very smart. I, I, these are some great tactics you've got in here. I was like, okay, he's nine. <laughs> hey, you got pictures too. So, I mean, it captured my interest, you know. There you go. Yeah, it's not meant to be a, a super heavy lift by any means. And it's got a story. And I have a brother who's a CPA. Heck, he read it. So I appreciated that. So um, who, is this, who is this aimed at? Is it, is it meant for small business owner? Is it meant for a director of IT or somebody just leading a team inside of a larger like enterprise type account or all the above? I would say all of the above. Um, I think, I personally think that if we don't start moving towards this model of teaming um, from a business perspective, you'll get left behind because you'll move too slow. Now, hasn't Um, that always been, at least the last 20 years, by like, Look at our teammates. Oh, we're we're family. Uh, you know, like Southwest Airlines, I think I actually did embody that, and they were and, and still are very much uh, family focused. I mean, it's a I forget what they call themselves, but you know, they're, they're team members or whatever, not just employees. Yep. Hasn't that mantra been around a long time, and our companies just not adopted and applied it well? Um, so I think there are different companies. So Southwest is a little bit of an anomaly, right? Zappos as well. They run a different organizational model called Holacracy, which, um, not many companies run and at scale haven't been able to run. Um, but it's a pod type of view. A lot of what we talk about in the book. And then I would say the majority of the companies that are out there that have been around for 15, 10 to 15 plus years are running running more of a command and control hierarchy um, and pretending that there's collaboration and teaming that happens in that structure. It's why a lot of companies have moved uh, away from a performance rating scale from an enterprise perspective because it doesn't, um, you know, it's like, hey, we want you to team together, but we're going to rate you against your peer in your same group on a one to five rating scale and we have to have a bell curve. Well, you're not going to team with somebody that you're competing against for you know, for money and um, potentially um, being seen as a high potential or, you know, a different career move or development. So there's a lot of work still out there to be done. And I think, um, yeah, you're right. So I think we're constantly evolving. 
and changing. And we've been saying we have to evolve and change and we're hitting another moment, right? So um, many, many, many companies are moving more and more into the digital space. Everybody's probably digitally transformed out <laughs> because we've been hearing about it for so long. But I would say also that's a West Coast thing where, you know, we feel like we're cycling or cycled through it and it might be a little bit old, but we are working in many, many spaces where, um, you know, the digital effect is still not necessarily new, but it's definitely not old, you know, in any way. And um, working in what an do you environment. Mean, what do you mean the Go digital ahead. effect? Uh, just people moving um, the things that they used to do, maybe that were more um, of a on-prem view or, oh, uh, like, uh, you know, like, like a remote worker or cloud or yeah. um, different apps taking on different things that used to be more manual in nature, you know, so um, banks, you know, they're slow to go through these shifts because there's a lot of security and regulation, but they are going through these shifts. Um, UPS, man, they've been going through a transformation for the last um, four years or so trying to <laughs> keep up and, you know, not get squashed by Amazon. So there's, you know, there's a lot of examples in that space and they're happening, but um, there aren't a lot of people I would say that are helping the people move into that space. And that's really what the book is for. It's for the people to be able to pick up, develop, continue to change with the times and keep running so that they don't become not necessary. You know, we, we look at a lot of companies that have a lot of long-term employees um, that need development too. Right. So you talk about uh, companies, this command and control structure of ranking employees against one another. I mean, if, if you're not ranking against the other staff, how else are you ranking? And how, how do you know who the performers are and who needs to be let go? Yeah, it's a great question. So most of the companies, so we've worked with a few different large companies to move away from the ratings to no ratings. And you have to have ongoing conversations with your staff which is a novelty, or your employees. So typically these kinds of coaching conversations we see happen twice a year, mid-year review and end of year. And typically it's associated to some sort of um, rating and then in a discussion that gets documented. So you look at, in the new way, it's conversational based. You look at what somebody's doing and how they're doing it. Um, in a rating view, you're primarily looking at what somebody did. What did you produce? Which starts to drill people down to a task level of like what widgets were there versus what did you do and how did you do it? And the how is a fairly new phenomenon where you can't be, you know, I, I think we've all worked with the person that's like incredibly brilliant, but man can't work with anybody to save their life. And they just run everybody over, steamroll them and, you know, and, and soar on. And they get hired and they get a lot of money and keep going, you know, but they tend to hop around quite a bit as well. And it eliminates that kind of behavior to people that want to work together and, and drive something forward to an outcome. You also give more control over to your managers. So typically in this um, fashion, managers are given a, hey, here's your pot of money. You're going to have to figure out how to sort it out based on um, what your, your people are doing. So is this all woo-woo, snowflake, millennial hand-holding management, or is this real? Is this real? <laughs> I hope it's real. I mean, it's how I run my own business and it seems to work. Um, it's how we've implemented it with other clients seems to work. Um, so I think, you know, to the point that you said earlier about the teams and the woo-woo, like if anybody uh, asked you if I was woo-woo, they would definitely say no. A, I'm not a big hugger, so I have to work on that. Um, and, and B, you know, we're always driving towards something. And I think the outcomes part is a key component. It's like, I'm more focused on let's get rid of the stuff that doesn't add value and that every that we're wasting our time on. Let's just not do that. Right. And let's focus in on the stuff that adds value and let's drive that stuff like nobody's business. Right. And when you do when you have that kind of focus, how you can you can do amazing things and you can move faster and you can you can have fun doing it. And but in order to do that, everybody's got to be aligned to where you're headed. You got to know what you're doing. You got to know what your role is. You need to know what everybody's role is. And um, you need to be transparent about your work. You got to show your iterations. 
you have to say you don't know sometimes because we don't know everything. You got to call and ask for some help. And, and you have to do what you're really good at. And I think honing in on that strength of that people bring and understanding what they're, I think everybody has a strength like this, like really innate, like something they're really good at. And if you can uncover that in your people, Kai, you can light them on fire. Yeah. You know, it's like, hey, you know that thing that you do, Kai, just, I want you to do that all day long because you are so amazing at it. And rarely is somebody going to be like, nah, I don't want to do the thing I'm good at. Right. I'm going to focus on my weaknesses. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I listen to this and I'm like, that's such common sense, but I know, yeah. it's, but I know it's not. It, it, people, they don't get fired for buying IBM. They stick with the process. They don't want to rock the boat. Uh, and so they, that's why I say like small businesses now more than ever are at such a, an advantage because the big companies don't win automatically anymore. It's those that can respond the quickest, right? Yeah. Whoever's the most agile right now, things, man, with robotics and artificial intelligence and nanotechnology and 3D printing, I mean, everything is going to change yeah. uh, now, right? It's going to continue, yep. you know, blockchain, uh, there's a lot of issues with it, but it's here to stay. They'll, they'll figure out how to use it. And so find people yeah, well, that are good, let them be good. Yes. Yeah. Right. And you're right. It does feel like it's, you know, seems so like a dumb moment. And sometimes we show people stuff and they're like, but that's so simple. And it's like, yeah, but why aren't you doing it? Right. <laughs> and then they're, and they're like, you know, and then their face just kind of drops and you're like, I hear you. Like, I know you don't want to pay us this money to do this, but you've like completely overcomplicated yourself. We're just, right. we got to get back to these, these core things to your point, because you need to move just as fast as the small businesses because they are coming up and running. Um, and it, you know, at the end of the day, it makes a healthier organization in my mind Yeah, where people want to show up and, you know, I have a lot of empathy. We all work really hard and I got really lucky early on in my mind to be able to, buy oxygen and do something that I loved for so long. Right. Um, not everybody gets that opportunity. And it's like, how do we bring a little bit more of that back into our workplace so right. that it's not terrible? Yeah, it's so hard. I just, me finding assistance, you know, I, it's like they, they think, oh, you want me to just check your email? I'm like, <laughs> I want you to do more than just check my email, right? Figure out like what's important. Unsubscribe. Hey for me I understand who the bsers are like start to use your brain figure out this is spam you know yeah. and then Think find critically. ways to make me more efficient you know find uh efficiencies of scale and improve the process don't just check my email just do what i do right yeah, i can make do me, that make me better yeah. you know <laughs> and it's like it's hard to convey that message to people a lot of times yeah. You know, is it, is it our school system? I mean, just beats out any kind of ingenuity, like stand up, oh, one bell, stand up, two bells, turn to the left, three bells, begin walking, you know? It's well, like, you have a lot of kids, so I kind of don't like, don't want to broach this because when I know when I had kids, I started watching um, Sir Ken Robinson. Have you ever heard of him? No. He's amazing. I watched his first TED Talk. He was one of the first people to do a TED Talk. Oh, well. which I think is kind of cool, right? With where we're at with TED Talks. <laughs> um, and he talks about the school system. He is British, but lives in your neck of the woods. Um, oh, do and, schools kill creativity? Yes, I have yeah, seen that. Yeah, yep. Yes, and, he and that's why we've homeschooled. <laughs> okay, there, yeah, right? So um, we, uh, I do deal with this on a regular basis too. And like, no, you can think outside the box and I don't care if your teacher said that that's wrong. I, I kind of disagree. You know, my junior AP teacher told me I was a really bad writer. <laughs> so when I published the book, I just wanted to be like, here, take this. Have this, you know, and it's like, it's amazing what teachers, the influence, right. That, that we have. And then look at the old structure, right? The bell rings, like that's from an assembly line. We don't do that anymore. We're automating that. You know, there's so many of the, you know, you used to line up in, in rows, which you still do in college, which just kills me. It's like, it, it's just not how our world works anymore. Yeah. So yeah, it kills a lot of creativity and um, 
I think we have to keep fighting against that. He has a he has an updated uh, TED Talk out as well, which is fascinating. So he just did one recently, did a podcast with him. Um, kind of the same subject? Yeah. Yep. But, but a refresh from where we're at, you know, it, because there are a lot of movements happening where there's different schools popping up and different countries are taking on the challenge. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think our public school system um, has a lot of movement to make from a holistic standpoint. Right. I will say, if anybody from my own neighborhood listens to this, I love our public schools <laughs> that we're in right now. Um, and yeah, we're really I mean, we fortunate have... to, to have a very strong principal. <laughs> yeah, we've got, we've got a good school system here. I mean, so three, three out of my four oldest have gone through high school here. And my, my daughter, she's a junior. But one, we homeschooled from, I don't know, second grade through high school. Uh, mm-hmm. My fifth, she's going to go to high school at the same high school, but she's been homeschooled her entire career. Uh, so, I mean, there are some good schools out there, but it's more like yeah. that's the exception and not the rule. And even within yeah. this, we just had to pull my daughter from a class with a bad teacher. Yep. You know, and the school knows she's a bad teacher. She has the fewest kids in her class. She has the most transfers out of her class, but because yeah. of tenure, there's very little they can do. Oh, interesting. So, so that we're still in elementary school. So we're, yeah. we have, we have a, and we have a wonderful principal who's super hardcore on hiring. I would say it's nice. probably one of her biggest strengths. Yep. So yes, there's a lot of work that we have to do, you know, with the kids. And I think also defining what success is in your family. Right. And I think that that varies. And I think we have a lot of assumptions as a society, what success looks like. And I think it's very different, you know, for the kids today than it was for our parents or even for us. Right. And so um, that's something that I always like to look at and talk about with parents because it's interesting, right? The assumptions that we can make about what success could look like. Mm -hmm. What does your kid think success looks like? Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. Yeah, it's always the wrong question. What do you want to be when you grow up? And it's like, yeah, you know, what interests you, right? What lights your fire? I mean, yeah, um, you know, try to follow that, um, right? Because we all know that, like, you spend so much time doing whatever it is that you're doing, you gotta like it. <laughs> and I see people commuting, right? So, oh my gosh, Friday I flew back from Austin, and I landed at at four thirty on a Friday. Ouch, in Southern uh, California. Yeah, into San Diego. And the crazy thing is leaving San Diego, zero traffic. I drove 45 miles in 45 minutes, you know, probably 50 miles in 45 minutes. We, we can haul right. ass it out here. <laughs> nice. Uh, and then getting into my little Temecula Valley, 45 minutes to go 15 miles. Yeah. You know, and just so congested. I'm like, you know, I'm in a bad mood doing this once a month. You know, there's people that do it five days a week, both directions. I can't imagine. That is no way to live. I agree. You know, and people, they think I've got to do that. Or they'll, they may have a job right here and they're like, well, I got a better offer. It's $15,000 more money. I just got to commute. And I'm like, do the math. Not a better offer. You're losing money, right? right? I mean, for me to make that commute, they'd have to double my pay. Yeah. You know, for yep. me to consider it. It's just yep. they don't they don't value their time or life, the cost of the vehicle, the being away. You know, it's like, why are we afraid to sit in silence and like ponder something and pursue something deeper? Do you know? Can, can you answer that for me? <laughs> I cannot answer that question. All I can tell you is that from a very long time ago, I decided that a commute was not a thing that I was wanting to ever do and so you know in part having your own business can make that easier right so you can decide where the office is or isn't yep but you know even back when i wasn't i moved specifically downtown in denver and i had a three block walk you know to my job there and then i moved to europe and i lived a couple train stops you know from the office it was like it, it just the priority was not i like that commute time just was gonna kill me right so Knock on wood, you know, we fly around and do all sorts of other things, but I don't commute, very, but it saves me to be able to see my kids, right? Yep, for sure. I know. Mornings and nights. 
Amen. But I, I wouldn't be able to do it if I had a 45 minute commute. Right. I know. It's crazy. Yeah. So in other words, we should all question everything we're doing. Huh? Don't take it for granted. Look under the hood. Ask yeah, why, I, why the hell yeah. something's done that way, right? Or just be curious about it. Like somebody told me a long time ago, it's like, you know, just ask why we're doing it like that. You know? And that, I don't know. Is there a better way? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe we're doing it the right way. That, that's what I tell prospects. Like I teach my sales clients, sales training clients. You know, it's like, I need to have experience, whatever. How much experience do you have, you know, in, because we're in a uh, alpaca uh, grooming industry. How much experience do you have with alpaca grooming? You know, and I'm like, none, which is exactly yeah. why you need me. Yeah. I will see things you don't see. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be Everybody's amazing. Everybody's just making assumptions. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, when, when my wife says, uh, you know, go get the peanut butter from the, from the pantry. Well, that's not a bad one because I know where the peanut butter is because that's my food. All right. But if she says, like, go get the asparagus, like, I have no idea. And she'll say, it's on the third shelf from the top on the right, just behind the cheese. I won't see that. I will not see it. I, I just, uh, I got this mental block. I'm, I'm not going to find it. Whatever my wife sends me to get from the fridge, I won't find it. And it'll be like, it's right there. It's just right there. I mean, we literally have these blocks where we can look at something. Yeah, and not see it. it. Mm-hmm. You know, because we're too close to it. It's the curse of knowledge, right? Which So, yeah. so bring an outsider in. Yeah, that's why outside um, perspectives are so good to have and not just all employees. You know, yeah. we've worked with kind of different companies and different points. And sometimes they think, well, we should just hire another person to do that. And it's like, well, it's not a long-term need that you're going to, you know, have this thing for. So you, it's probably better to have an outside perspective for six months than to hire somebody that's going to become just like the you know, other thing that you're trying to fix. Right. Interesting. Amen. Yeah. All right. Well, we will send people to your site at oxygenexp.com. Uh, okay. The book, is it out now? I know they sent me an advanced is. copy. It All is right. now Radical out. Radical Outcomes. Yep. Very nice. And so, it at any of your favorite retailers and in Korean, apparently, because it's being published in Korean. Very nice. There you go. Here in Korea. I liked it oh, there nice. very much. Very cool. Very cool. Well, congratulations on that. So uh, any parting words of wisdom for our listeners? No, you know, I, I think I love the curiosity bent. So somebody tells you to do something just you know I say hey can I have a little bit of context don't say why because that's rude and nobody wants to you know nobody wants to do that but uh, I'm a huge fan of context can you give me some more context about that I'd love to know more yeah it's a really easy way to figure out how to how to get somewhere yeah I um I talk all the time about you know sales training and of course people bring up you know ABCs of selling always be crazy. You know, Alec Baldwin and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. And I'm like, so you old. have you looked at the clip lately? <laughs> that movie is from like 93 or 94. Yeah. It was yeah. based on a play from the eighties yes. written by a guy who watched his dad in sales, like in the sixties and seventies. Right. His dad was taught by people from the fifties. So that saying is literally 60 years old, at least, yeah. at least it's rooted in that, you know? And I'm like yeah. the new ABCs of selling, like you said, always be curious, mm-hmm. always be concise, always yeah. be um, courteous, you know? It's like, say, yeah, kind with a C. Yeah. yeah. I mean, stop close. So I, I loved your approach. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, I, I guess I was kind of like you. It's like, even now, like, I don't worry. I don't have a quota, right? It's my business. But I'm not just staring at the numbers. I'm, I'm not going to, and like I sell software as a, as a certified partner, right? Companies come out with yeah. the sale. And I know that the employees, they need me to make a few more sales for them to hit their numbers. But it's like, right. I'm not cutting a deal. I literally, I have one, one star Yelp review in my entire life. And it's from a guy That's awesome. that I didn't want to sell to that I knew would be a problem. Yep. But a guy at the company, needed another sale to hit his numbers. So we cut a sweetheart deal, this guy who was a jerk, you know, and we went over and above. You always do for those people. And he goes on to <laughs> yelp. He goes on to yelp, right? I'm like, <laughs> are you kidding for your business. Like you should be super happy that he went to yelp because like, who cares? <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. But it's, but it, you know, I, I did a deal basically for the money, right? I mean, I, yeah. I didn't, yeah. I mean, less money, but it was to help somebody. It's like, all right, I, 
because I don't do that. Right? I didn't do it as an employee in corporate America, but man, uh, imagine that, huh? Serve, serve your clients. And uh, I tell people even now, I tell more people no than yes. You know, yeah. they'll come to me looking yep. for some software. And I'm like, I know you want the Cadillac, but you've got to start with the Chevy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you're not there yet. You can start one of those electric scooters in downtown San Diego. <laughs> <Not there. laughs> and that might be amazing. And then you're not going to overpay for this big thing that you don't actually. Yeah, exactly. Great. But anyway, yeah. I'm glad I'm not alone. So uh, thanks for coming on the show. <laughs> no, bro. <laughs> I'm happy to be, be your, your reassurance. <laughs> All right. If you ever come to SoCal, you want to do some wine tasting, hit me up. I will. Definitely. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming on the sales podcast. It's been great.